So here I'm going to be giving my spoiler free review of the Marvels. Now this is going to be a spoiler free review. So for those who have not seen the movie, you don't have to worry about any major story spoilers or surprises. Though judging on the box office, apparently that's a lot of people who haven't seen it. Now it's been no secret that things have not been great for the MCU in recent times. Due to the very hit or miss nature of their projects, you know, just general interest has declined. We've seen that through viewership of the Disney Plus shows, the box office for some of their recent films like Quantumania. There's just been big trouble for Mar and Marvel everywhere you look. And ever since marketing for this film began, I had hesitation thinking, uh oh, this could be trouble for Marvel. It's not that I thought the trailers were horrific or anything like that, but this movie just had a lot of stuff that fans, skeptics, and most importantly, those wishing for the downfall of Marvel and Disney in general could look forward to. Now, when your movie is mainly playing off of the first Captain Marvel and Secret Invasion, you're naturally going to be inviting a lot of skepticism and as a result, asking for trouble. Secret Invasion just came out a few months ago and that had a lot of creative decisions that didn't sit very well from fans. And of course, there's the first Captain Marvel. Now, if you go back to the MCU pre-Endgame times, I definitely think this is one of their weakest films. There wasn't anything that stood out or that was great about the film, really nothing that was great. Relatively unremarkable story, poor character development, you know, it's about a badass who becomes an even bigger badass. It's not a very inspiring story. It's not a flat out terrible or bad movie or anything, just flat out mediocre. The main reason that it was the big commercial hit that it was, was that obviously it was teased as something important at the end of Avengers Infinity War, and it was coming out right before Avengers Endgame, so people thought, oh shit, I gotta see Captain Marvel to understand Avengers Endgame. Turns out that was just flatly not the case, you didn't really need to watch that film to understand or get into Endgame at all. Now I did watch the first Captain Marvel again recently before watching The Marvels, and it hasn't risen up in terms of my standing amongst the MCU, but that's more of a result of what I've thought about recent MCU films. Now this film going into it though was going to be a test of the audience viability of tying in the film so heavily into the MCU shows. Multiverse of Madness started this with the whole tying in heavenly into WandaVision, which was a huge hit, so it made sense to do that. However, given how the Marvels was tying in heavily to Miss Marvel, the Disney Plus show, which didn't get great viewership, it was fair to raise question as if this film would suffer as a result. Now, I saw the first trailer and marketing for this film at D23 when they had the three actresses come up on stage seeing, talking about the film. So that's where I got my first taste of what this movie was going to be all about. The Marvel sees Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel, forced to work with new superheroes Monica Rambeau, who doesn't have a superhero code name, and Kamala Khan's Miss Marvel. Once an occurrence causes their powers to become entangled and they end up switching locations anytime they use their power. So they then have to work together to stop a liberator from seeking to get revenge on Carol Danvers by hatching a plan that will devastate multiple planets. The immediate question that should get answered here is how accessible is this film for those who have not watched the Disney Plus show, specifically Miss Marvel. Now I wouldn't fit into this because I did watch WandaVision, which as I mentioned was a huge hit amongst audiences in terms of viewership, and Miss Marvel, which wasn't such a big hit in terms of viewership, though it did get good reviews. Now obviously it goes without saying that if you're seeing this film, you've likely seen the first Captain Marvel. And based on the huge hit that WandaVision was, most people know and saw who Monica Rambo is. The real question is Miss Marvel. As I mentioned, Miss Marvel was a quality show, had a fun youthful spirit to it, though it did suffer in the villain department. However, it didn't get great viewership. While the film quickly establishes here what kind of character Miss Marvel Kamala Khan is the first scene you see her, you're definitely going to be missing something if you had not watched the show before the film. You know, you're going to be missing her fandom for superhero universe that she's into, you know, her family dynamic, what it meant for her to become a superhero. The movie does, it does its best to provide a quick basic understanding of these elements, her character, but it isn't going to mean as much if you have not watched the show. Just how like how watching Multiverse of Madness would be strange, pun intended, had you not watched WandaVision. You'd be like, what the fuck? What happened to Wanda?
While it's definitely risky business to take this approach, I do like the ambitious storytelling approach here because it does connect all of these what would be separated stories rather seamlessly rather than waiting for the next Avengers story or to get another sort of major crossover event or just waiting for a direct sequel. You know, as someone who does still keep up with everything Marvel, even though it can be a chore at times, it still feels like a reward for the continued fandom and watching these things, even during the trying times. And it's not like the marketing for the film didn't give viewers ample time to catch up on the necessary things before watching the film. So it is what it is. As far as this film goes, I mentioned that I wasn't a big fan of the first Captain Marvel film, so there was a lot of room for improvement with this sequel. Now, the film doesn't really take long to get to its power switching or location switching gimmick in the trailers. It's all within the first 20-ish minutes. That's when you get the occurrence which causes the whole location switching gimmick to happen. Right after this though is where the film just had some god awful editing. You know, there are just some jarring, jarring cuts and weird transitions that made me question the sanity of the filmmakers and specifically the editors. Shortly after this though, we get a scene showcasing the issues with the location switching thing with the trio using their powers in an action scene where all three are in very different locations. And this scene was fantastic. The action and the energy were great. There was creative stuff done with the switching, including the enemies who were switching locations also and that caused a lot of issues. And the soundtrack playing really helped the scene a lot. It was just a really fun, well done scene. It made me think that, wow, if this movie can keep up this kind of energy, this could be a fun time. This takes roughly about no more than a third into this relatively short movie. After this, the plot of these three working together really does kick in. Now, as a team, the Marvels end up having some really good chemistry. The actors played off of each other well. Captain Marvel is the centerpiece here, and she has to deal with the initial tension that Monica Rambeau has with her as a result of their history, centering on her mother's death, and on the opposite side, Kamala Khan's intense fandom for all things Captain Marvel, and just the youthful enthusiasm with being part of sort of a larger superhero story. The film is able to find solid balance showcasing these characters through moments that made me like them together. Captain Marvel herself is just much more likable this time around. The added character dynamics of working with a team in terms of the specifics with Rambo and Kamala just helped her grow as a character and really humanize her. In the first film, you know, she has passable, bare minimum stuff character-wise going on in, in the beginning when she's tormented by the lack of knowing who she is Wolverine style. But then once she unlocks her full potential, you know, there's just nothing interesting or fun about her as a character. You know, she's a god. She can't be touched. And she acts that way the rest of the film and in Avengers Endgame. The character is just much better this time around. This helps somewhat getting over the issue with her being as overpowered as she is. And she definitely is. I mean, at the end of this film, she does something to where it's like, wow, if she can do shit like this. She's basically a god. But the whole power location swap thing hampers her a bit, so that helps a little bit. I still love Monica Rambeau. Her character was such a pleasant surprise in WandaVision, and I really liked her here too. I like how the tension between her and Carol wasn't anything overbearing or that she didn't have this whole sort of childish pettiness. She just had moments where she just had to be real with Carol and about how she felt. And those moments brought out the best in her and Captain Marvel herself made them really good as characters. Kamala will certainly be endured for a lot of audiences if they haven't really watched the Miss Marvel show yet. Her opening scene is stylized in a way that's like just right out of the show. So you're going to kind of get it and get a taste of what that show is like. Also, she just has that kind of enthusiasm that a lot of teens that we've seen in the MCU would have if they're part of this whole larger sort of superhero universe, which is why audiences have loved Tom Holland's Spidey, Kate Bishop from Hawkeye, and you can definitely add Miss Marvel to this list. You know, she was just a really, she's a fun, likable character. Definitely my favorite scene with all three of them was when they were learning to coordinate their location switching. It's a really well done scene that humanizes them, lets us have fun with them, and just makes us like them as, as characters in all the right way. Now character wise, I don't feel as positive about the antagonist here. The character's name is Darben. She acts as the successor to Ronan the Accuser from Guardians of the Galaxy, the first Guardians of the Galaxy. You know, she kind of carries the same weapon, even acts and talks like him. 
The character was ex expectedly pretty pretty one note like Ronan was, though thankfully there's a little bit more or a lot more actually nuance to this story when you see the reason why she's doing what she's doing. It's all in order to save her planet, which we actually see what's wrong with her planet and we understand, oh shit, why she wants to save it. It's just that her saving her planet will KO a few planets including, you guessed it, Earth. That's the real positive dynamic with her character here, and at least I was able to em emphasize with her stakes a bit, despite the character still being pretty flat and one note overall. Now weirdly, Nick Fury is surprisingly used mostly for comedy here, and that's a big surprise considering how we saw him in Secret Invasion a few months ago. Now his best moment for me was definitely his reaction to a location switching moment between Carol and Kamala. It involved falling for those who have seen the movie and it was a really fun just quick line that was like oh man that had the whole audience just laughing. I just hope going forward Nick Fury isn't used just for pure comedy and he's just not relegated to that going forward because I don't think that would be ideal. That's all of your main characters there. The Marvels, the antagonist Darben, and Nick Fury. Now for your non-main character MVP here would definitely be Kamala's mother. You know, she was great in the show, but her character is either intentionally or maybe unintentionally hilarious here, and how stern she's being despite the sort of crazy circumstances surrounding her, but at the heart of it she really has love for her daughter and her family as a whole, so she was a great character. Now despite an uneasy start, there were some consistent good laughs throughout the film most of which came from Kamala's Marvel fandom, though there were a few times where the movie was arguably reaching or going too far for laughs. The main instance where I felt this way, or a couple instances, were one when the Marvels travel to a planet that has a gimmick that's just straight out of a Disney film. It's a pretty out there concept, I don't know who the hell came up with this, uh, there were some parts in it that were amusing, and thankfully I guess it didn't go on longer than a few minutes, but it was a very weird diversion that the movie took. The other scene that I felt this way, and again I'm not going to give major spoilers about what happens, but it involves Goose. Goose was that scene-stealing Flarkin cat from the first film, where tentacles just come out of its mouth and it can suck up basically almost anything. <laughs> Now there's a scene that involves just a whole bunch of these flocking kitties, and the scene is just legit funny. It honestly feels like something that belongs in a Guardians of the Galaxy film, just because the whole scene is something that only someone like James Gunn could come up with. But I definitely think it'll be the most memorable scene for a majority of the audiences here. I've talked about a decent amount of the positives here, and that's because overall the Marvel surprisingly comes together pretty nicely as a film. It ends up being a fun major improvement over the first Captain Marvel. Pacing's good here, characters were a lot better, there's good action in segments, and the comedy, writing, and just the fast pace and short runtime of the movie made it a decent fun time. You know, there's a lot that could have been cringe about this movie, and maybe in parts it will be for audiences, but I think a majority of the audiences that go in with a fair mind will have a good time with this movie, and I actually surprisingly did. So, this movie would end up getting a 7.5 out of 10 for me. Initially, I was thinking 8 out of 10, but I've always realized that, you know what, whatever you're feeling coming out of the theater, it's usually about one sort of half point below. So, 7.5 out, out of 10 for the Marvels. So, I think it's like a solid, good, fun time at the movies. The audience that I saw the film had a good time. Granted, it was a Thursday night Dolby screening, so it was definitely a lot of people that wanted to go and enjoy it. It was a packed audience, and there was a lot of enthusiasm for the film leaving the theaters, especially for the ending and the mid credit scene. Now, the ending of the film, the final minutes before the run, but the actual credits roll, is something has something that I would describe as amusing. You know, it may or may not lead to anything significant going forward, but there was a decent amount of the audience that got a kick out of what they showed. And then there's the mid credit scene. And wow, you know, it's just an all time mid credit scene. Definitely the most impactful mid credit scenes in Spider Man Far From Homes. You know, I think it's going to be the big payoff of what this whole multiverse saga is going to be if the whole shenanigans of Kang the Abuser aren't that amusing to some. You know, we've seen it teased in a few spots here and there, including the Miss Marvel show. 
but seeing it actually sort of in its full form to some degree and seeing that scene with an audience and the reaction afterwards it was definitely something special now this was a thursday night screening that i went to and for movies like this a thursday night screening is always going to be packed packed with audiences people ready to see the film you would have thought this movie had a gangbusters opening weekend but for the entire weekend as a whole the box office turnout for this film was abysmal at the time I'm recording this, the final box office results have come out. And this movie did $47 million domestically on opening weekend. Yikes. I can't. Can you? I got it. Just a disastrous box office result. I mean, that's worse than The Flash. The Flash that just came out a few months ago, that did about $50 million. This was even less than that. I guess the initial projections were for it to be like $80 million or something like that, which wouldn't have been a great result, but this is just far disastrous. It's fair to say with the recent reception that Marvel installments have gotten, viewership of certain shows, and just box office results that they've gotten that have been less than ideal, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has entered a new phase. A phase where they've lost their audiences. There was a time where their projects could do no wrong. You know, you go back to like right after the, the, the first Avengers in 2012 and then up to and including Endgame, and, you know, some installments afterwards, you know, their movies, it was just hit after hit after hit. As I mentioned, the first Captain Marvel, despite not being a great movie, did great at the box office, was a big commercial hit. Now, a big part of that was, like I said, how it was strategically sandwiched in between Infinity War and Endgame. And like, like I said, the ending of Infinity War made it seem like you had to watch it before Endgame. But still, it was part of sort of just a huge line of hits that they had had. And this movie had a short runtime. You know, it's a runtime of an hour and 45 minutes. That's with credit. So the movie, like in terms of its normal start to finish of the movie, the story, like an hour, 37 minutes. It's actually the shortest MCU movie beating out, I believe it's Thor, the Dark World and the Incredible Hulk that were both like an hour and 50 minutes. So the big question is like, what went wrong here? Obviously, things have been pretty hit or miss for Marvel in the last few years. But like I said, this is just definitely the worst result by far of any of their movie projects. Now, I'm not talking about the quality of the movie. I'm just talking about the box office result. So what went wrong here? Well, there has been the issue and people have sort of been talking about this over the years in terms of oversaturation of Marvel. Just the fact that they have so much that's come out. You know, I remember when they started doing the Marvel shows and when you got into the year of 2022, where there was like four or five Marvel shows and then you had like three or four movies. It just got to a point where there was just so much, you know, I thought they had a good balance where they was doing like maybe two or three movies a year. But you add in the Marvel shows, it just made it be like, wow, that's uh, that's a bit much. Also, what could have gone wrong here sort of involves what I was talking about with the Marvel shows, tying this movie so heavily into a show that didn't get great viewership with Miss Marvel. You know, that show, despite being quality, it just came out of time or it came out at a time where the viewership for it just wasn't there. Now, part of it was the problem that they released it simultaneously with Obi-Wan Kenobi, that show from 2022 last year. So that probably wasn't a great idea. But still, tying it into a show that didn't do great in terms of viewership isn't going to be something to where the marketing makes people say like, oh, I've seen that show. I want to see that movie. They didn't see the show, so they probably didn't feel that way. Another reason could be like the first Captain Marvel. I think most people feel the same way I do to where it's like, well, yeah, it wasn't really the great movie. I kind of saw it just sort of out of obligation to understand the uh, endgame story. And that ended up not being so something that paid off. And like I said, Miss Captain Marvel herself as a character, I don't think has been a great character in her previous appearances. Now, they definitely made improvements for her here, some big improvements that made me like her. But like I said, before that, there wasn't anything about her as a character that probably made people say like, oh, I just got to see the next Captain Marvel adventure, like how I'd want to watch the further adventures of Spider-Man or the Guardians of the Galaxy. Then the final thing that probably went wrong here, like I said, when you have the, just the declining interest of the MCU, and we've seen that with the box office results of Quantumania, the Marvels now, Eternals, even Thor, Love and Thunder to some degree, and viewership, 
Viewership for Secret Invasion was not good. Viewership for Miss Marvel was not great. It's just you see the decline everywhere. You know, when you reach the heights that they did with the Infinity Saga culminating into Endgame, the peak, you know, the biggest movie of all time, at least for a little bit it was, until Avatar passed it again. You know, you have a movie, you just have, you're naturally going to have a decline after that to where people think like, oh, there's more going on after that. And what's been going on recently afterwards just hasn't been interesting people. And like I said, there's been some stuff from Marvel post Endgame that I've really enjoyed. Obviously, you got Spider-Man, No Way Home. I thought some of the shows like WandaVision, that was great. I really enjoyed Marvel's What If. There's been some other shows I like, like The Falcon and The Winter Soldier. There's been some good stuff there. Critical reception, the stuff like Guardians Volume 3, Shang-Chi, or Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Those had strong responses, so there's been some stuff that's definitely been quality. But for every one of projects like that, you get stuff like Thor Love and Thunder, the Eternals, Quantumania, which, you know, I liked more than most people, but the reviews for it and reception definitely weren't great. You go to this movie, which actually hasn't gotten the worst reception, you know, based on Rotten Tomatoes, it seems like people think like, oh, you know, it has its moments, it can be okay. But yeah, just a, put everything together and you had a movie that had issues with its marketing and people just not looking forward to it. That's where you get the result. Now, box office wise like this, this opening weekend is indeed abysmal. Now, does this movie have a chance in the long run? Well, I didn't end up breaking my normal review, normal rules of not sort of looking at reviews until after I've published the film. I did write and do my final score, but then due to when I saw the box office result, I'm like, well, let me check this out. And seeing that, I wanted to see why it would bomb, and I saw the reviews, which the reviews, Rotten Tomatoes score is decent. The consensus is like, hey, it's actually a fun time. Fun time, not great, but still fun. Audience score was decent, 83%. So I think like, well, does it have a chance in the long run? Well, if you think about it, like when Elemental came out, the Pixar movie about the whole elements, fire, water, etc. That didn't have a very good box office opening weekend. But word of mouth amongst sort of, you know, audiences was actually pretty decent. And the movie actually ended up having decent legs and ended up having an okay box office result. You know, people that I've talked to, sort of my colleagues that I see at work, my friends, they've all kind of had the same opinion I do to where they actually did enjoy the movie. It had sort of a lot of, you know, it had a lot of, a lot about it, a decent amount of it that made for a fun time. So with that, and it's like, well, what's coming out? It's like the Hunger Games. Is that really going to blow the doors off of anything? Then you have, you know, Easter weekend coming out. I think the movie has a chance to maybe do okay but obviously you know if the end result ends up being a reflection of the box office here for the opening weekend then the marvel era truly is over i mean that era of dominance and success is officially over where they could do no wrong and it'll be in the next few years that you just see some major changes to the mcu and you may even start to get a taste of that right now I mean, next year, the only MCU film coming out, and this is because of the writer's strike, is going to be Deadpool 3. So if people want to see what life without the MCU is like, you know, just wait for 2024 and you're going to get a taste of that. So that'll end up doing, th doing it for this review of Captain Marvel and just sort of the box office epilogue afterwards. It was a necessary one because this is definitely the biggest opening weekend bomb they've ever had. So if you made it to the end of this video, thank you for watching.